Open your Bible to Mark chapter 4 with me. We're going to continue discussing money because we need to. Um, as you know, we've been doing this a few weeks to make sure that Christians do money right. So we're going to keep on. How about that? Amen. Now, you know, one of the main reasons that we have to do this is because money is important to our lives and it can be a real problem in people's lives if it's not done right. So we're learning how to think about it right, how to earn it right, how to spend it right, how to save it right, how to invest it right, how to give it right, how to treat it right, how to be generous with it, because we want to do money right in every way. The problem is we have an enemy and his name is devil. And listen, the devil gets hold of people's lives first by their thought life. The devil keeps people from getting saved by putting wrong thoughts in them, blinding their mind. Then even if they do get saved, he will bother people first in their mind. He'll try to scare you. He'll try to get you out of the will of God. He'll try to disrupt your life enough to cause some disobedience. He'll do something and it starts with the mind. If he can get you obsessed in something else, if he can get you frantic about something, if he can just get you reasoning too long. Sometimes that's our biggest problem. We just reason too long. And the devil says, yeah, keep on, man. That feels good. And he'll pet you while you reason. Well, if you could see what was happening in the spirit, that'd make you mad. Stop petting me, devil. I'm going to cast that thought down like Jesus said to, because I'm not going to just stop trying to pet my head, devil. Can you imagine if Brother Emilio went around and petting everybody's head? It'd be like, get off me. Thanks for not doing that. <laughs> the devil is the deceiver. The Bible says that Satan will be cast into the lake of fire. Satan, that, that old serpent who deceives the whole world. Yes. He's the liar and the father of it. He's a liar. And there's no bigger area than finances for him to lie about. And so one of the lies is that you should want to be rich, but you can't be. So you should worry. <laughs> There's a whole bunch of lies in there. First of all, you, you shouldn't want to be rich, Amen. but you can be. Yeah. Right. He always flips it. So in our discussion about money, and every time it's preached in church in the, in the area of God blessing and taking care of us, we have to also add the fact that we're not supposed to desire to be rich. Those who desire to be rich will fall into temptation and a snare and into many hurtful lusts. So you cannot, you and I cannot desire to be rich. Amen. What? So how many want to be rich? I didn't see any hands. I didn't see any hands. You can't want to be rich, but you can be rich. So we're, we're trying to learn the Bible principles about money so that we do it right. So the first principle was you and I have to get rid of the poverty mentality. The opposite of poverty mentality is prosperous mentality. What does that mean? Uh, prosperous mentality means you expect to be wealthy. Amen. You don't necessarily want to, but you expect it. The poverty mentality is you don't expect it. You want it, but you don't expect it. And so what we do is we have to drive out the poverty mentality by learning the truth of God's Word. That He does expect His people to be wealthy. That wealth and riches should be in the house of the righteous. Amen. That everybody that walked with God were taken care of and then some. And that's all that wealth is. That's all riches is in, in the scheme of things. It doesn't mean millionaire. It doesn't mean a CEO multimillionaire. It just means enough and then some. Wherever you're at in life, as long as you have enough and then some, you're wealthy. Amen. You're prospering. According to the way your mind thinks, you're prospering. According to our, how our soul prospers. So we're supposed to know that God does not think poverty is more spiritual. No way. No way. God expects poor people to be spiritual. And He expects rich people to be very spiritual. So don't try to say one without the other. Don't keep them mutually exclusive. They don't have to be. We can have money. We just have to know how to treat it right and think of it right. Amen. So the first thing is get rid of the poverty mentality. It means you can't look at the empty. You have to look at the full. Yes. You have to always expect that you have plenty. 
Second principle is you have to work. Amen. Work is a principle. Right. If you don't work, you don't eat. Right. Yeah. Right. Amen. So you and I have to build in our system that this life is about work. And so a little vacation here is fine. A little leisure here is fine. One day a week, not doing much is fine. But you and I have to recognize life and success means work. Matter of fact, your happiness will be found in your work. People think happiness is when they don't have to work and they can just sit and watch TV. No, happiness is found in the producing something, in the serving people, in the, in the doing of the deed. That's where happiness is found. But that's another message. Then the third principle is you're going to have to be a giver. You'll have to take on the Christian attribute of generosity if you're going to succeed with money. So we're going to talk a little bit about giving again today, but Christians are givers. Fourth principle is that you're going to have to stop worrying about money. Jesus said, do not worry. He said it very loudly. Do not worry about your life. Do not worry, do not worry, do not worry, do not, do not worry about money or you'll never get rich God's way. And here's, here's one way to look at it. If a person worries and works really hard and in seven years they become very rich, they didn't please God. And really their heart won't be as pleased either. What you have to do is live by principle and not worry about money. Then if you get richer than you are, it pleases God because you trusted him. If I worry and work hard and make a lot of money and have a lot of breaks happen in my life and end up rich, but worried about money all the time and thinking about it too much, that simply proves that God was not my source. That proves that I was not trusting God. I was trusting myself. I was trusting this life. And what we'll see today is that it's not about an amount. The heart matters. It's all about the heart. People say, well, God knows my heart. Yeah, that's the problem for half of us. He does know our heart. You need to work on your heart. You need to make sure your heart's being totally honest about everything. And make sure your, your heart's not worried about anything. Be anxious for only the important things. Be anxious for nothing. Be anxious for nothing. <clears throat> Mark chapter 4. This is the parable of the sower. You just want to see one point in it. The parable of the sower where the sower sows the word. Some people hear the truth and get excited. Some people don't. Some people get kind of excited. Some people get excited for a moment. Here's the one, verse 18. Now these are the ones sown among thorns when they are the ones who hear the word and the cares of this world. And the deceitfulness of riches and the desires for other things entering in choke the word and it becomes unfruitful. So there are some people that hear the truth of God and get excited for just a moment, but the cares of life squish it out. We got so much going on. We got so many responsibilities. We got so much stuff we're into. We have so much uh, uh, importance placed on so, so many things. I mean, it could be just the kid, <laughs> just your ch just your one child household could be so consumed with him or her that the words choked out. Could be a grandkid or two choke out all the kingdom stuff. Cares of this life could be money, could be health, could be relationships, could be cousins. The cares of this world. You know, I got 15 quinceañeras to go to this year. That'll take up some time. You better manage that stuff. Well, I got lots of cousins. I know, I know, but don't let it impact your kingdom living. Anything could impact it. Cares of anything could impact it. Verse 19, the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches could choke the good word. Everybody believes in Jesus. Here's a good gospel message or a scripture. Glory to God. But if they don't handle money right in their own minds, if it deceives them in any way, then that word won't be fruitful and they won't please God and their spiritual life will suffer. And there's many ways that riches can deceive us. First of all, it could deceive us if we're rich and we get to thinking, you know, I got it made. Everything's okay. 
No, you don't trust in riches. You don't trust in uncertain riches. No way. We trust the Lord. That has nothing to do with it. Then on the other side, it could be that a, a poorer person that doesn't have much money is deceived into thinking, if I only had some riches, boy, life would be better. Boy, if I could just finally get on my feet financially, man, I'd be happy. That's deceiving. Truth is, you won't be happy. I realize that when we're in a predicament and, and under the water financially, I know that it's a strain and a pressure, and it'd be nice if that strain was off. But the way that that strain comes off is not with you getting money. Amen. You must find a way to get the strain off before you have money. Otherwise, you didn't do it God's way. You have to get in faith before you have the money. Amen. Otherwise, your circumstances is determining your happiness. Your circumstances determines how much you trust God. No, you have to learn how to trust God no matter what level of finances you're at. Right. And until you do, he ain't involved. That's right. Well, I'm going to worry. If I, if I didn't have all these bills, man, I wouldn't be worried at all. You just blew it. <laughs> that means that circumstances are going to tell you how to live. Mm -hmm. No, you better get your heart right. right. Get yourself in faith. Find out some truth from God's word. So that you trust him. <clears throat> when we tell people not to worry. Look. When Jesus said do not worry. Do not worry. Do not worry. You know that doesn't mean you just sit there and say. Okay. I'm going to try not to worry. Okay there. I'm not going to worry. I'm just not going to worry. Well. You might need to do that occasionally, but that's not how you get rid of worry. You don't get rid of worry by just sticking your head in the sand. Amen. You have to have a reason not to worry. That's right. That's right. That's true. That's it. We're not just talking about you trying not to think about something. We're talking about you having a reason not to think about something. Amen. And that reason has to be a foundation from God's word. Amen. I don't worry because I know God's word. I'm not worried because I have a promise. I'm not worried because I'm obeying Jesus. And I know God's will concerning my finances. So I have a reason not to worry. I'm not just blindly, la, 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 don't tell me nothing about my money. No, no, we have a reason. We have something else to lean on besides worry. Either you're leaning on worry or you're leaning on God. The deceitfulness of riches could be the fact that, think of this example. We work 40, 50 hours a week. You have to put a lot of time into work, don't you? You have to put a lot of time into a vocation. 18 years of school, then four more years for a degree, or two more years of a trade training. You got to do something that's a lot of years put into the fact of, I, so that I can earn with what I do. That's a lot of effort. Right. Then you got to work 40, 50 hours a week. Yeah. That takes a lot of time and a lot of physical, a lot of mental strength. And I mean, that, that puts it on you. Then you compare that with two hours at church on Sunday morning. Which one seems more important? Come on. Come on. In the scheme of things, it seems like the 40, 50 hours a week is the most important thing. So we, we devote to that. We're, we're committed to that. I mean, nothing's going to interrupt my 40, 50 hours a week because my paycheck depends on it. But what if something impacts your two hours on Sunday morning? It's like, eh, no problem. That's only a couple hours. So the deceitfulness of riches is this is more important because I spend more time. Right, right. Well, that's deceiving. Riches... And livelihood is not more important than the kingdom of God. Amen. Seek first the kingdom of God. And then all these other things are added to you. You have to put your time and effort and thought first into the kingdom. So even though it takes less time, pretty much, it's still more important. So don't let money become more important than God or church or, or serving at church. I mean, think about the job you do 40, 50 hours a week. To earn money, man, you got, a, you got a position that it, you have responsibility. Over here, you might just shake hands when people walk in the door. It's like, which is more important, just shaking hands? Eh, shaking hands, I can skip that a few times. 
No. 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 Even though it takes less time, it might be more important than any job. What if your shaking of a hand helps somebody get saved? I don't want to get into every group here, but how many of you remember the first person that greeted you when you came into church? All the churches I've been to, I remember the first person that greeted me. That was a big moment in my life to attend a church. Okay. You understand, right? That that's a soul touch. That's something of the soul that's, you can't really put a price on those things. Anyway, so that's the deceitfulness of riches. There's many, many ways to look at that, but you and I have a responsibility to not let money be deceive, deceiving in our minds. Right. Got to get it straight. Right. Got to be real honest. Let God speak to you because we're going to hammer this stuff. I feel like we have to hammer this. We have to hammer out of us the desire to be rich. I am here to hammer it until you stop wanting to be wealthy. They're like, yeah, it's a paradox. You can be wealthy according to God. You can be wealthy because he's your partner. But you can't want it. You can't be looking at your, you know, pining after having more money. So I'm hammering that out of you. So that you stop having a false, deceitful dream. On the other hand, I'm going to hammer into you a prosperous mentality where you expect to have plenty all the time, where you never think in your own mind, I don't have enough. I want to hammer that out of you. But I don't have enough. Shut up! Hush up for six months. And then we got a shot. That's why Jesus said, take no thought saying, what shall we do? He knows. He, at first he said, don't think about it. Then he said, at least don't take any thought saying it. Because your, your tongue sets your course. <clears throat> okay, turn to uh, Malachi chapter 3. How many Italians are in here? Anybody Ita Italian? Have Italian? If you're Italian, it's Mal Malachi. Okay, so go to Malachi chapter 3. <clears throat> All right. Malachi chapter 3. So, so let's... Let's set this up here. Okay, so when you start talking about giving money, when you start talking about giving to God, the questions arise, well, how much do I have to give? How much do I have to give? Everybody look up here. We're not going to read Malachi yet. <laughs> how, how much do I have to give? I've got to give money to God. How much? How much do I have to give? You just blew it. This have to give business, it has nothing to do with the Christian's heart. Have to give is not the Christian life. How much do I have to give is what a Hebrew would say. It's what a Jewish person would say under the law. How much do I have to give? 10%. As Christians, after the cross, under the new covenant, we don't say how much do I have to give. Changes everything. What the Christian does is live by principle. What's, what the Christian does is has this close relationship with God... Where rather than wonder how much I have to give, it's, can I give everything, God? Glory. I love you so much, I give you everything. He's not trying to take anything from us. I, I, he's already given me everything. Amen. He gave me Jesus. Amen. It has nothing to do with how much I have to give. It's how much will I give. Amen. It's all about how much my heart values God, loves God. It's all about my heart now. So let's make sure our heart's right. Amen. Because in the New Testament, look, in the New Testament, in the, Old Te the Old Testament had some commands, the New Testament makes them harder. Did you know that? The Old Testament said don't kill. The New Testament, New Testament said don't even hate or you're a murderer. Made it harder. 
The Old Testament said don't commit adultery. The New Testament says don't you even check them out. Yeah. <laughs> or you've committed adultery in your heart. Yeah. Made it harder, didn't it? But with the Holy Spirit, it's not harder. What he's trying to do is deal with the heart motives. We're not talking about you, oh, I want to kill him so bad, but I'm not going to kill him. Okay, I'm, I want to kill him so bad, but I'm not going to kill him. God's not pleased with that. So a Jew would walk away and God would say, thank you. A Christian would walk away with that heart and God would say, what's wrong with you? I put the love of God in you. You ought to have no problem not killing somebody. See the difference? Same thing with giving. The Jew could come with their 10%. Oh, and God would say, thank you. Appreciate that. I commanded you. You did it. Good job. But if a Christian comes like that, God's like, I don't even accept that. You didn't do it right with your heart. You got a new heart now. You have a heart that can do this right without being commanded and hammered and threatened with a curse. See the difference? So we're not talking about have to. We're not talking about commanding and enforcing everybody. We're talking about you and I getting our heart right. And, and, and you, you and I need to go to the extreme in our own minds. Amen. What I mean by that is this. In the New Testament, a fellow came to Jesus and says, Jesus, what do I have to do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said, you've got to obey the commands. He said, hey, I've done that. I've not murdered. I've, I've done this. I've honored father and mother. Jesus said, there's one thing you lack. Go sell everything you have, give it to the poor, and then you come on and follow me. The Bible says the rich young ruler went away grieved because he had great possessions. Jesus wanted him to sell everything. So first example in the New Testament of giving, it's everything. Are you willing? Is anybody in here willing to give everything? All your savings. All your extra. We have to be willing. I know you're praying he doesn't ask you to. <laughs> but you have to be willing. And if, and if you're thinking, I'm willing, but oh, please, God. Then you need to go another step further and think about it a little bit longer till you get to the place of, you know what? I could do that. And I'd be, so, I'd be totally fine. Now, if you only have five bucks in the savings account, it's a lot easier. <laughs> if we're talking about five bucks that you have to give it all. You're probably thinking, yeah, what, what good is that? Exactly. <laughs> but if it's 50000 see, you need to practice these things in your soul to make sure your heart's right. right. If God wanted, uh, I used to say this, if you need to let God put his finger, finger on your money. And if God put his finger on your money, what are you going to do? Yeah. I want to touch that. I want to touch that. What if God said, I want to, that, that, your favorite savings account, that one that you look at too much? <laughs> I want to touch that one. <laughs> what would you do? I want to touch your car account. Most people don't even have one of those. but You follow me? Are you okay with it? I'm taking time here. So that you think about it. You need to take some time and realize, you know, what if he did ask me to give it all? Could I? Okay. And then you also know in the book of Acts, when the church, the early church got really happy. Remember they got really happy that, that they got filled with the Holy Spirit? Remember they, they really started loving Jesus a lot? Remember the early church? They really started loving Jesus a lot, so much, they, they all sold everything they had extra and brought all the money in to give away. Vacation homes, gone. Extra cars, gone. All your savings sold. Every extra is sold and distributed to those that might have need. Now, they brought it to the church to distribute. They already had a building. Right now, we're just trying to get us a building. <laughs> But there is a lot of giving that we do. There's missionary stuff. There's support for ministry. There's training. There's discipleship. There's all sorts of things that the money's needed for. They got so in love with Jesus, they gave it all. 
Are you able to do that? Have you ever gone through that in your own mind? Or are we just attenders of something somebody else has done? All right. It's about to get good. Just hang in there. It's about to get good. It's good stuff, right? Look, we need to chisel off the worldly thought of money, the world's way. You've got to chisel that off of us. So here's a Malachi. Oh, and the early church did it twice, too. Acts chapter 2 says it. Acts chapter 4 says they did it again. Apparently, they're, getting pros they're so prosperous, they're, they got it coming in in harvest. Uh, Malachi chapter 3. Now, you have to understand that he's going to mention tithes and offerings. So when the, uh, in the Hebrew or in the law, Jews understood that the tithe was a command. God commanded one-tenth in various ways. He commanded the first fruits, which we studied, the first and best. He commanded that. Then He commanded also one-tenth. And so in the Hebrew, the, lang in the Hebrew language, tithe, T-I-T-H-E, everybody say tithe. tithe. That's a Hebrew word. And it means one-tenth. So in English, it means 10%. So when you hear the word tithe, it simply means 10%. You understand? The Jews were commanded to give the tithe, and they had laws that if you don't, penalty. And then so we're going to read in Malachi about the tithe. Now, one scripture over in, in the Old Testament says, The best of the oil, the best of the wine, the best of the wheat, the first fruits of them they shall offer to the Lord. And whatever first is ripe in the land, they shall bring to the Lord. So it's this first fruits and this tithe principle. I like to combine those two principles. It means your first best healthy portion of income should go to the Lord to honor the Lord. Because the tithe is holy to the Lord. That means it's set apart. Holy means sanctified, set apart, separated unto God. First best big healthy most important to you portion is supposed to be holy to the Lord. It is holy to the Lord. It's supposed to be holy in your action. Make sense? Okay. So here's where Malachi is, uh, even though this isn't in the law, this is way after the law, he's referring to a couple things. Uh, matter of fact, let's, let's start with Malachi chapter 1. This whole book, is written to a nation who had stopped honoring God in many ways. Malachi chapter 1, verse 2 says, I have loved you, says the Lord, yet you say, in what way have you loved us? Stop there. Sounds like Christians. Well, if God loved me, then how come this? Well, I thought God loved me. How come... That's where they were. They weren't close enough to the Lord to accept His love, believe in His love. So that's, that's how this begins. Yet you say, in what way have you loved us? And then skip down to verse 6. A son honors his father and a servant his master. If then I am the father, where is my honor? And if I am a master, where is my reverence, says the Lord of hosts? To you priests who despise my name. Yet you say, in what way have we despised your name? It's like if you're not willing to hang out with the Holy Spirit enough for Him to talk to you, lead you, direct you, have you address things in your life, that's what Christians do. What do you, what do you mean I had not been honoring God? Verse 8, and when you offer the blind as a sacrifice. He's not talking about blind people. He's talking about your blind lambs and animals. Because they were suppo supposed to bring animals without blemish. The first of the flock, no blemish. The most perfect animal had to be sacrificed. What's that doing? That, that's showing that you honor God. I'm giving up that thing that I like the best. He said, and when you offer the blind as a sacrifice, is it not evil? And when you offer the lame and the sick, is it not evil? Offer it then to your governor. Would he be pleased with you? What if you gave the government your leftovers? <laughs> uh, 
Uh, okay, go ahead and re go ahead to verse uh, chapter three. Verse 8, will a man rob God? Yet you robbed me. But you say, in what way have we robbed you? <laughs> in tithes and offerings. Tithes and offerings. So 10% plus. You've, you've robbed me in 10% plus. Then verse 9, he says, you're cursed with a curse, for you've robbed me, even this whole nation. Verse 9 is what we can cross out under the New Testament. Glory. Really, honestly, God would not be offended if you blotted that scripture out. Because Galatians 3.13 does exactly that. The Bible in Galatians 3.13 in, in the New Testament says, we are re Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. Which was, if you disobey, you get cursed. Here, you disobey, you're cursed with a curse. Christ redeemed us from that, so we're not under the curse of the law anymore. Amen. So there's no threat from God to you about your money. I said, there is no threat from God to you like this anymore. He's not threatening you to coerce you to give. He did that for disobedient people. The law was given not to the obedient, but to the disobedient. How many of you are disobedient? Don't raise your hand. God is letting you choose to obey rather than Him hammering you until you do. It's the beauty of Christ. It's the purpose of the cross. It's the reason for the blood of Jesus. So that God could have a people that wanted Him. That He didn't have to force to Him. So this whole thing's all about the heart. Verse 10, bring all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be food in my house and try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such a blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. Lord. We're not redeemed from that. I would say God still will open the windows and pour out the blessing. Obedience and faith always produce a blessing because we believe God. Verse 11, and I'll rebuke the devourer for your sakes that he will, so that he will not destroy the fruit of your ground. Listen, if you're in faith, the devil can't destroy you. If you're in faith, God will rebuke the devourer. If you're worried and not obeying money principles, God will not rebuke the devourer and he will find lunches to eat. The devil walks about like a roaring lion seeking whose lunch he might be able to eat. No, seeking whom he may devour. And that's why some things go wrong. For long periods of time, the devil's eating people's lunch. Well, get in faith and do it quickly. I'll rebuke the devourer for your sake, so he won't destroy the fruit of your ground, nor shall the vine fail to bear fruit for you in the field, nor shall your employer fail to pay you. And all nations will call you blessed. You'll be des delightsome land. Verse 13, your words have been harsh against me, says the Lord. Yet you say, what have we spoken against you? You have said it's useless to serve God. What profit is it that we've kept his ordinance? And Christians are like, well, what good is the tithing? I've been doing that for six whole months. All right. Go hang out with your Malachi friends. <laughs> We're talking principle here. We're talking a heart that loves Jesus. A heart that's never going to get a grudge or bitterness against God because they've been coming to church for three years. I mean, coming to church and being as faithful as I can. <laughs> Apparently, not really. Apparently you were just show. You were all show. <laughs> <clears throat> Praise the Lord. All right. Turn to Joshua chapter 6. Joshua chapter 6. But notice it says tithes and offerings. So there's 10% plus. Um, the tithe for the Jews was a thread that ran through just about everything. 
Even so much as when they took the promised land, Jericho was supposed to be a tithe. Before they took the city, remember God told them all the rules about marching around seven times and then shouting the walls down? He said, but listen here. Uh, now, I'm, 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 making the, I'm saying it in the Texan way. He said, now listen here, but you cannot have the city. You're going to spoil the city, but you cannot have the city. You can't rebuild it. You can't live in it. Nobody can. He said, matter of fact, it, uh, he who builds, re rebuilds the city will be cursed. And he said, and you can't have any of the money. So all the, the silver, gold, and all the spoil comes into the treasury of the Lord. Right? Jericho was supposed to be the tithe for the promised land. Think about it. They've been waiting for this promised land for 40 years. Finally, they get to cross the river. Finally, they start taking it and God says, you can't have it. That's very similar to how we get a job. Praise the Lord, I'm going to get some income. And the income comes in and it's like, but you can't have it. The first healthy portion, got to go to God. What? You following me? What he's doing is he's training them to have a right heart. All of their training was so that we could live in freedom. So that we could live by principle. So that we could do it without being told to do it. If somebody ever sticks their finger in your face and says, you have to give, you just grab their finger and pull it down. We don't get to coerce people like that. Amen. Now, if it's your friend and they're trying to rebuke you with all love, then that's another story. <laughs> the honest Christian, if, he, if anybody puts their finger, if anybody rebukes you, an honest Christian won't say, don't judge me. An honest Christian will say, hmm. Wow, are they right? What have I done? Okay, well, that's another story. So Joshua chapter 6 here. <clears throat> Joshua chapter 6, verse 19. God told them, but all the silver and gold and vessels of bronze and iron are consecrated to the Lord. They shall come into the treasury of the Lord. Uh, look, read verse 18 too. And you by all means abstain from the accursed things. Lest you become accursed when you take of the accursed things and make the camp of Israel a curse and trouble it. See all that cursing stuff? Uh, that word accursed, does your Bible say accursed? In this context, it, it doesn't mean cursed like demonic or cursed like false god or, or a cursed image or golden uh, false deity. Accursed means separated. In this context, it means separated for whatever reason. So don't touch the separated things lest you become separated. And make the camp of Israel a curse. So a cursed does not mean exactly curse. You follow me? But I, when you read this first time, it's like, what were these accursed things? They must have been some really evil little trinkets that he stole. No, it wasn't that at all. Look at chapter 7, verse 1. But the children of Israel committed a trespass regarding the accursed things. For Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zebdi, the son of Zerah, the tribe of Judah, took of the accursed things. So the anger of the Lord burned against the children of Israel. So one family, one fella, took of the separated items. And the whole, God was mad at everybody. Because they let it happen. But now skip to verse 21 just to see what he did take. Because then he got punished. Verse 21, when I saw among the spoils a beautiful Babylon. This is uh, verse 20. I'm sorry. Joshua 7, 20. And Achan answered Joshua and said, Indeed, I have sinned against the Lord uh, God of Israel. And this is what I've done. When I saw among the spoils a beautiful Babylonian garment, 200 shekels of silver, a wedge of gold weighing 50 shekels, I coveted them and took them. And there they are, hidden in the earth in the midst of my tent with the silver under it. So what did he take? What were the accursed items? It was the money. He took of the tithe. He took of the thing that God said, don't you touch. Because the tithe is holy. Because the tithe represents your heart 
sanctifying yourself to God. That's why the word tithe is still used today. What, do I have to give 10%? Again, you just blew it. You with me? If you think in your mind, I have to give 10%, you've just missed the whole point of the new covenant. What we see here is principle. We see how God looks at things. He's trying to get us to see and understand a healthy first fruit portion unto Him. Keeps us in covenant with Him. Keeps us in honor of Him. Honor the Lord with your substance and the first fruits of all your increase. So turn to Mark chapter 12. We'll get some New Testament examples here to drive this point home. Mark chapter 12. Verse 41. Mark chapter 12, verse 41. Now Jesus sat opposite the treasury and saw how the people put money into the treasury. Notice he saw how they put it in. Well, what does that mean? Well, you can certainly see their face. And Jesus could see their heart, so he wanted to see their motives. He wanted to see if they were cheerful about this. He wanted to see how, how much attention they were trying to get. How the people put money in the treasury, and many who were rich put in much. And then one poor widow came and threw in two mites, which make a quadrant. I'd say that's two dollars. Could be two pennies, two ten, two, anyway, it's two bucks. Just a little bit. So he called his disciples to himself and said to them, Assuredly, I say to you, this poor widow's put in more than all those who've given into the treasury. For they all put in out of their abundance, but she, out of her poverty, put in all that she had, her whole livelihood. Now look up here. When we start talking about how much to give to God, God knows your heart. You know your heart. God is not looking at amounts. Now some people say, whew, praise the Lord for that. No, but he is looking at your heart. So for all those people that think, yeah, well, God knows my heart. He does know your heart. We're not, we're not talking about amounts because I, I, the thought crosses. If, if you're having financial difficulty or if you're poor in your own mind, then sometimes people look around church and say, well, you know, my little, what I can give is, is nothing compared to what other people can give. So I just hold on to mine. They, they got to raise $425,000 this year for the thing, man. I, What's my 10 bucks going to do? I'll just hold on to it because so, I know somebody's given, you know, 10,000 or 1,000 or so. Well, what good is mine? You just messed up. You just blew this thing. You just disconnected your heart from God in a huge way. Because God is not comparing amounts between people. He is comparing you to you. It's not about an amount. He saw this woman put in her last two dollars. He says she gave more than everybody. Her, her treasure in heaven is more than everybody's. So you have to recognize that you give from your heart and God sees that. The other point you got to see is the rich people gave a lot of money. Certainly God must be pleased with that. No, because God's not looking at the amount. He's looking at the amount that you should have given. He, he, he's looking at the potential that you had. He's looking at your heart. So for a rich person to say, you know what? I guess I, I can afford that. I can afford that. You want to give, how much you want to give? I, I, we can afford that. God doesn't accept that. Just throwing in what you think you can afford. They give in of their abundance. If you have an abundance, you better start thinking bigger. There's some, there's some rich people that, you know, gave a thousand bucks, thought that was big, and they should have given 10,000. There's some others that gave 10,000 and really they have enough they should have given 100. And again, people are thinking, is the pastor trying to get my money? No. No, don't give it to me. Matter of fact, the pastor in the church is not the one that receives your money, it's Jesus. The the money goes to the high priest. Jesus is the only high priest there is. When you give, you have to give to him in mind. I mean, for the sake of things that we're doing, of course, but it's always unto the Lord. So no, I'm not trying to squeeze money out of you. Absolutely not. I'm trying to get your heart right. I'm trying to keep all of our hearts right. I'm trying to challenge everybody. We need, everybody needs to stretch in here. 
trying to stretch us all to be prepared to give something big. Well, if I ever got anything, I'd give it. No, you wouldn't. You need to practice now. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Where your treasure is, there's your heart. And that's a big deal. That's a big deal. Yeah, you know, I've told you my story about when I uh, <clears throat> was in the world, I was not walking with God. I'd always known that Christians tithe because my parents did. I always knew I was supposed to give 10% because my parents did. I always thought as soon as I get out of college, get me a job, I'm going to give my 10%. Just like mom, even though my lifestyle was, was not Christian, uh, and so the time came, I, I didn't, I graduated, got a job, didn't start tithing for one, two, three, four, five years. And then I realized, you know what? I, I always said I was going to tithe. I didn't even have a really, I didn't have a church to go to, but, but I knew I was supposed to give to God. So I, I saw on TV, there was a telethon, brother Pat Robertson. He was one, one of the two that my parents really honored. And, um, I thought, aha. I'm going to give to the 700 Club. Some of you don't know what that is. And I pledged 100 bucks. It wasn't a full tithe, but it was something. For me, that was a lot. 100 bucks a month. And I started sending that in every, every month, 100 bucks a month. And just doing it faithfully, still living a heathen life. And then about a year later, I, all of a sudden I was in the kingdom Saved, baptized in water, delivered from sin, hanging out with Christians, filled with the Holy Spirit, serving the Lord, never missing church, reading my Bible, hungry as all get out for God. And I thought, what happened to me? How did this happen? Well, one thing that happened is that I started putting my money in the kingdom. When I started putting my money in, my, my heart went. And I saw the, the principle that where your treasure is, there is your heart. You want to get more dedicated to God, you're going to have to put money in. If you start taking money away and not giving to God, your heart will drift. I promise. I promise. Even if you still attend, even if you still read your Bible, your heart will pull back and you'll become less loving, more rebellious, more grudging, more finger pointing. You'll get weird. Something will happen to you. You'll, you'll get weird and you won't be a real healthy Christian anymore. I've never seen a healthy Christian that didn't give a good full first fruits or 10% or 20% to God. You know, no, we're not stuck on 10%. You understand, right? I don't know why people are like, do you have to give 10%? No, you can give 12% if you want. 12%. I was thinking the other direction. I know you were. Everybody <laughs> thinks the other direction. Everybody's trying to keep more for themselves than for the kingdom. Where does that come from? Well, it doesn't come from God. Come, must come from the devil. Amen. <clears throat> so how much? Well, I, you have to figure it out in your heart. What can you do? What, what, what does your heart start feeling? Right. When does your heart start saying, <laughs> when your heart starts feeling like that, now you're getting somewhere. Now you're really making a commitment to the Lord. Oh, I'm committed. He knows I'm committed. I sing to him every day. <laughs> People love how much David sang. They love how much David danced. They never want to talk about how much David gave. <laughs> he gave? He gave? See, you skipped over that scripture. <laughs> He gave billions out of his own money. You got to find something in your, in your life that works, okay? When I was traveling the ministry, uh, wasn't making much money. Uh, sometimes 100, sometimes 300, sometimes nothing. Sometimes, you know, 50 bucks, whatever. I say I was living on beans, whatever, whatever, I, whatever they gave is what I lived on. And I always gave 20%, 10% tithe, 10% offering. That just seems standard to me. I don't like to have to rethink everything. I don't want to reinvent the wheel every time I... 
So every time, if I got a hundred bucks that weekend, I was in the next weekend, I'd be in my home church and I'd give 20 bucks. How much? What, what was the offering? That, that I got? 20 bucks. I remember one time I was <clears throat> traveling, preaching in this church for three days and, and they gave me a hundred bucks for three days. And I'm driving home in Texas, but I'm driving home uh, that night. And I thought, you know, it's kind of late. I'm gonna, I, I need to get some sleep. So I'm, but if I do that, then I'll have to pay for a hotel. And I thought, that's going to that's gonna impact my profit. <laughs> my little $100 profit. I, I always felt like I, I need to make some profit off every trip to make sure I feel like the gospel's taking care of me. <laughs> and so I, so I went ahead and, and paid for the best Western hotel, whatever, 60 bucks, 70 bucks, I don't know. And so I went in and got me a hotel room. Now I thought, well, I'm kind of hungry thought, but if I use this money to buy some food, it'll cut into my profit. And I thought, you know, I got to eat though. So I went ahead and ordered a pizza and I ate my pizza in the room. And I think I left over with about $12 profit for three days. How about that? <laughs> but that's, that was my life. I get home, of course, and I'm going to give $20. I made, I made a hundred bucks. I'm giving, I had to find some other money to give my $20 tithe. See how that works? Out of all your increase, you have to give you your heart. You don't use your calculator to give. You use your heart. Right. I heard Jesse Duplantis telling stories about his early days in the ministry where he had, one time he preached and all he got was a Dr. Pepper out of it. <laughs> you do what you got to do. You do what you got to do, but you don't stop living by principle. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Still to this day, Joan and I give over, it always turns out to be over 20%. Our standard is less than that. Like we're, our standard is always about 12 to 13. Or I think we go up every year or something. But, but, then, but then we give offerings because all the projects and all the extra things and all the other meetings and all the people and all that, we give extra. So our church giving is always 20% or more. I didn't hear any hooping and hollering about that. <laughs> And then somebody's thinking, well, yeah, but the church pays them. So what's the deal? Okay, well, we'll keep it then. <laughs> Listen, don't let devil logic get in you. I'll find it out. <clears throat> Praise the Lord. All right, do y'all want to read any more scripture? Or y'all want to try to wrap it up here? Let me see if I can find a, another way to come at this. Look, when it, when it comes to money, you, you got to follow the principle. Proverbs said there's somebody that scatters, scatters a lot and he still increases. And there's another fellow that says, oh man, I can't... He withholds more than he should and it, and it leads to poverty. That doesn't make any sense. That doesn't make any sense. Does it make any sense? Isn't it if you keep more than you have more? Not in God's kingdom. To, to get, you got to give. Is that right? To be first, you got to really be last. Right. To sit in the front, you really better start in the back. Yeah, that's good, that's to get high, you got to get low. To get exalted, you got to get humble. Oh, it's just a backward amen. system. Amen. So you give and then God opens. Amen. It's just the way it is. And when we start, we're talking about giving. So, so, so there's giving to God, yes, but there's also giving to people. Right. You're going to have to get generous to people. We're, we're trying to resurrect the faith handshake. Amen. They used to call it the Pente Pentecostal handshake, but use the word, word Pentecostal these days. Half the people don't know what that means because we don't have Pentecostal on our sign. Pentecostal means you believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit. That's all it means. Pentecostal means not that you're of a denomination, but that you believe in Pentecost that it's for us today. Amen. That's why we sometimes hear the word Pentecostal. We're Pentecostals in that yes. way. Amen. Not in some doctrine way, but in the baptism of the Holy Spirit way, we're Pentecostals. Amen. So really it just, and, and the reason that it's called a Pentecostal handshake and not a Baptist handshake is because there's something about the Holy Spirit that turns you generous. Yeah. There's something about the fullness of the Spirit coming upon you that changes you. You become more of a lover of people and more of a gener generous Christian. It just seems to happen. There's exceptions on both sides. But that's why they call it that. So, but since we don't know what Pentecostal means sometimes, let's just call it a faith handshake. Or, or you come up with a better one. You, that's your assignment. You come up with a better term if you don't like faith handshake. And what that means is when you shake somebody's hand, there's something in it. 
It's always a challenge to make sure it doesn't fall out as you shake their hand. <laughs> just to bless somebody. When was the last time you brought a $100 bill to church just to bless somebody? Well, I didn't know who to bless. And you never will. <laughs> Why don't you bring it with, a, with some, just bring it, just in case there's somebody. I, I, I love this, this cashless society, uh, but you still have to have cash so that you can bless people. Right. Or you can be a Venmo person. Right. But Venmo requires the other person to have Venmo. Right. Everybody that's laughing is a techie. <laughs> that's a way to exchange money between two people. It's easy. Zell. Zell? Yeah. Fine, 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 fine. Fine, free. Okay, fine. See, there's more techie. Just when you think you're techie, everybody, there's always somebody better. Always somebody that knows more. We're talking about giving to people, though. Okay? I remember I told the story before. I went to the car wash a few years ago. I uh, got my car washed, and um, it was actually on a Saturday because Sunday was a get, uh, we were picking up a guest preacher. Maybe it was a Friday, Friday or Saturday. But we were, I was picking up a guest preacher to come preach for us, and I wanted to make sure the car was nice to honor the preacher. And so I went and got it cleaned, and, uh, you know, they dried it, and I took off. And, you know, you usually tip the, dr the, dry, you tip the person, you know, as you pick your car up. And at this time I didn't. I usually do, but this time I didn't. And I uh, drove off. And I'm driving down the road, and I'm thinking, you know, I probably should have tipped. I always tip. And the Lord spoke to me, and he said, you, he said you've gotten kind of stingy lately in your giving. He said, you haven't, you haven't been free lately. And I knew exactly what he meant, and I could feel it. I could feel being stuck in just distributing freely. Now, I never held back tithes and offerings. I'm not talking about that. I'm just talking about extra generosity. And I thought, you know, you're right, Lord. And so I turned around, made a U-turn, drove back to that thing. I'm thinking, I'm going to give her, I'm going to give her a good tip. And I'm thinking, 20 bucks, I'm going to give her a $20, $20 tip. And I got out my wallet, and there wasn't a 20 in there. It was only 100 in there. And I thought, oh, I'm stuck now because I already said it in my heart that I'm doing it. Yeah, you got to live that way. And uh, I didn't ask for change. I thought, I'm going to give her a hundred dollar tip. Here it goes. And I handed it to her and she didn't look at it. She kind of grabbed it and, and just kind of, I'm, I'm thinking, no, 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 no. I want you to see what this is. I want to rejoice with you. But she didn't look at it and I didn't make a big deal. And so I just drove off. But I drove off happy. The monkey was off my back. I felt free again. Glory to God. No devil's going to stop me from giving money to people. And we had church for the next two and a half, three days. And uh, it was really interesting because uh, that was the first time that this happened. Uh, after Sunday, the, the guest preacher called Joni and I over and said, hey, I want to give you all something. And the church had given him a good offering and, you know, for three days, a good offering. And uh, he wrote us a check for $3,500. A guest pre traveling preacher gave the pastor money. Wow. That is unheard of in the gospel. <laughs> Very special to me that that happened, okay? But I know it was connected to me getting free. Your financial abundance and such is connected to you staying free in these arenas. So you can't ever get a little sour face. <laughs> That means you're not free. That means you're not going to partake of the blessing. The windows of heaven aren't really open. And now it's just frustrating. Now your giving just turns into frustration time and time and time again. I like the principle. I mean, I liked him, him doing that so much that I thought, you know what? I'm going to do that. When I go preach for somebody, I'm going to bless the pastor. See, usually the guest preacher gets all the money. Pastor don't ever get the big thing. Very seldom does a pastor get a big thing. These guest preachers get the big thing. It's like, bye-bye. The pastor, pastors for years have, bye-bye money. There it went. And so pastors have to fight, you know, hey, well, if I bring a guest preacher in, that's people giving. This is just internal pastor thoughts, you know. And, and I won't let those in me. I, that, that's never, that's never going to be a thought in me because I fight that thing. 
I'm not going to get into that. No, I trust God alone. I bring guest preachers in whether we have money or not. Absolutely every time. Now we do kind of govern. We don't want to put too much burden on people. You know, asking for offering after offering after offering. But, you know, we got to get spiritually fit here. So that's why we do things. But anyway, so I started doing that. Giving a tithe to the pa tithe off the offering that we get to the pastors. Not that I have to, but it feels good. So I'm going to keep doing it unless the Lord says don't do it. Amen. One of the first times this ever happened to me about this devil thing, getting the monkey devil off the back. I was in a church, I was in a, it was early, my third, fourth year in the Lord, and I'd been traveling and preaching and such, and uh, I was in these meetings, extended meetings for several months, and, you know, I was there pretty much every night, maybe four or five nights a week when I was in town, um, and just meeting after meeting and offering after offering and always giving and always giving, and I'm sitting in the, in, in one, the bucket's passing, here it comes, and I, my thought, this thought came to me, oh, you've been giving at all these meetings, why would you want to keep giving? Why give a little bit? I mean, you've given so much anyway, you know, you don't have to give. And I caught myself having these thoughts and I thought, that's, that's the devil. The devil's messing with me during the offering time. I said, that ain't going to happen. And I said, that's it, devil. I'm giving everything I got in my pocket, whatever it is. And I pulled out four $20 bills. That was all I had. And uh, threw it in the bucket. Glory to God. Felt so good. Had zero cash on me. But... Full of faith. The service ended and I'm walking out and this fellow comes over to me, somebody that I kind of was acquainted with a little bit in the church and he uh, shook my hand with a little something in it. <laughs> you know, you kind of, you don't want to act like you want to know what it is, but you want to know what it is. <laughs> These days I've gotten over that. So if somebody does that to me, I'm like, wham! <laughs> And, and I, I run out to the truck almost as fast as I can on the inside. And, I, and it was a $1,000 check. That was a quick return. Okay. Now, some people are thinking, well, I've never had that happen to me. You know, I can't promise it's going to happen like that just because you gave a little extra money to somebody. Okay. Uh, but in your life, you, that's how God trains you sometimes. So for me, I know that God was showing me that I was right. He was showing me that I had heard from God. He was showing me that I was correct about the devil sitting on my shoulder. And so now he doesn't have to do that every single time. Now the money can come from different sources. I stay free and he takes care of me. He, he, he's ne God's never going to let you treat him like a vending machine. Well, I put my money in. Where's my goodies? He's never going to let you get like that. But in your life, you might see some signs and wonders in moments of training where you heard, you had faith, you obeyed, and then bam, you knew for sure, but you can't expect it the same way every time. He wants to do it a little differently every time so that you don't just figure him out. The point is we got to get free enough to bless people. Free, free, free. Well, I'm a, I get kind of scared sometimes when I get extra money in my pocket. I'm like, man, that's going to probably disappear pretty quick. Yeah. It's just the more I have, the more I just want to spend or give to somebody. I'm not spend. I mean, I, I'm, I'm logical in spending, but in giving, it just seems to disappear. Praise the Lord. Give me some more. Right. Right. Yeah. Amen. I remember the first time I ever gave a hundred dollar bill away. It was at a McDonald's in December. Uh, this is way back when I was traveling and preaching. And uh, it was McDonald's December and a lady came in with her children. They all had bare feet. A hundred bucks. There you go. Praise the Lord. Helped them for Christmas, I'm sure. That helped me start getting free. Buying people's groceries, doing... Hey, look, just find a way to get freed from your money. Amen? Amen. Amen. Part of this, especially... Okay, so you can give to God, you can give to the poor, you can give to each other. Uh, part of giving uh, includes this covenant-making ideal. All right? And in these days especially because we're so isolated and I, I just, this came to me just this morning. Um, you know, we, we, we do this box thing. We, we live in a box, we get up, we get ready. We go into the box that's connected to our box, get in our, our other box and drive out. And we're in the box and we stay in the box till we get to the place of where we have another box and we get in that box 
And then we go to work inside the cubicle box, inside the big box, and so we have our space, right? And if that's not enough, we have headphones in case somebody actually wanted to talk to us. What? We're stuck in our own little world. And then we got our other little box we pull out of our pocket and we enjoy what's in that box. And then we go home and we watch what's in the other box. So we're just kind of boxed out. And it's, and it's caused people to be a little bit disconnected. And in this culture, it's very disconnected. And in a big city, it's even more disconnected where we're all just kind of by ourselves. You know, a small town, you're a little bit more connected to people. But regardless, we're in a big city. So we have to make extra effort as Christians not to be isolated. As Christians who want to kind of uh, resist the world's way, we need to put time in with each other. We, we need to make relationship. And not think we can all just live on our own, even though the delivery people allow us to live all by ourselves. And I know we got some delivery people in here. Thank you for your service. Praise the Lord. But coming to church counts. Coming to all the meetings we do counts. Because you don't have to. You can live life without people. But as Christians, we know each other by the love we have for one another. And we owe it to each other to love each other enough to come and bring the casserole dish to the meeting. <laughs> or chicken. Fried chicken counts. Yeah. Cookies count. Store-bought things. Every, anything counts. And if you can't bring something, bring yourself. That counts. But covenant making is done through giving. David and Jonathan, remember that? David and Jonathan made a covenant and they exchanged their weapons. They exchanged their belts. They exchanged their lives. It's a symbol of exchanging my life for your life. I'm going to live for you. I'm going to serve you. I'm going to protect you. I'll live for you. I'll die for you. We're in this together forever. So when we give gifts, and this is one thing we teach at weddings, when you, know, you bring wedding gifts, there's wedding gifts exchanged, there's rings, there's money, there's stuff happening at a wedding, and it's, a, it's an exchange of lives. Right. Well, in the church and in the, in the body of Christ, uh, when we give gifts to one another, that's covenant making. When you just have a good little feeling about somebody in church and you think, I love them, give them something. And when you sit around thinking, you know, how can I bless them? Man, they, they, I love them. Whether it's money or not, bless them. That's covenant making. When I first got in the kingdom, I, I saw this happening to me. The people that I loved, I wanted to give them stuff. And one of the strangest things that happened is I had all these rough friends, you know, a bunch of heathen acting friends. And uh, when, I got, when I got in the kingdom, I loved them still. Sure, you can love your heathen people, absolutely. And, and, I, and I started buying them big gifts, which was absolutely unheard of in our circles. You know, heathen circles, it's, it's you know, I ain't paying, you pay. I ain't, who, who's going to, I don't want to drive, I don't want to pay for gas. If I drive, you pay for gas. I mean, it's a fight. Who pays for dinner? Who pays for gas? Don't steal my money. You, you robbed me. You didn't, you, you didn't ante up, you know, type thing. <laughs> And so I started giving these big gifts, and, and the, the expression on my two, two or three friends' faces told the they're like, why are you going to do this? I'm thinking, I love you, man. I love you, man. I felt so good. I love you, man. <laughs> well, in the church, same thing. I want to, I love you. I want to bless you somehow. That's how it ought to be. Makes it special. So we're just givers, right? Amen. We, just, we just can't help it. Amen. We're givers. Givers to God, givers to people. No more penny pension, no more hoarding, no more greediness, no more stinginess. That's the devil's way. Amen. And so we got to break free. And you and I are responsible to stay free. Like I said, this, this monkey thing jumped on me. <clears throat> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Uh, I, I need to tell the monkey story. The Panama, Central America, Africa monkey story. The way, the way that, <laughs> you know, in other countries they eat, in other countries they eat monkeys, right? They eat monkeys. All parts of monkeys. Don't tell the story. Tell the story. They eat monkeys and so they have to, get the monkey and kill the monkey and clean the monkey. But to do it, what they do is, is they set a cage like a, you know, like a chicken coop cage um, 
or a gourd of some sort like a coconut or something that they can hollow out and cut a hole in. And then they mount it to the, to, the, uh, to the ground and the hole is about as big, it'll let the monkey's hand get in there, you know. And at the bottom they put fruit and stuff and attach it to the ground and uh, the monkey sees it, puts his hand in, grabs the fruit, whatever it is, and when he makes a fist, he can't get his, his fist out of the hole. It's too small. And so then it starts scree squeech, squ squealing, screeching, you know, monkey screeching. So the trapper knows, aha, I got me one. And so he goes over there and gets his prey, right? It's okay. It probably tastes like chicken. <laughs> and you'd never know the difference if somebody served you some monkey. And it's, it's really the dumbest thing. It's like, why doesn't the stupid monkey let go of his food? Because that's his prize. That's his prized possession. He's got him. He doesn't realize that he is trapped because of his greed. Because he can't let go of the thing that seems like it's so important to him, he is trapped. And that's what the devil has done to Christians. The devil has trapped Christians by telling them you can't let go of that. When the truth is, if Christians would just let go of what they've got, they would be free. And so you and I must take responsibility for our own life, our own soul, our own consciousness, our own hearts to stay free and not worried about money. Now soon we're going to get into the principle of saving or investing and doing something with money. We're not talking about just never having any money in the bank. You understand? Uh, but, we, but we do have to stay free enough to be doing all of it. There's a way, no matter what level you're at, to do everything everything you're supposed to do with money. To give it, to save it, to invest it, to plan with it. Thank you for joining us for the preaching of God's Word. We trust that your faith and your love for God is stronger than ever before. More information about Stevenson Ministries and Houston Faith Church is available online at HoustonFaith.tv. Chaz and Joni Stevenson are the pastors of a dynamic, growing church in Houston, Texas, and have a New Testament vision of preaching the uncompromised Word of God with the power of the Holy Spirit, helping people get saved, and building strong Christians who can impact their world. Houston Faith Church is a place where the love of God is real, where lives are changed, and where followers of Jesus become fishers of men.